Good evening again. Thank you all for your presence again. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I titled my sermon to be The Road More Traveled, uh, a little bit of a play on uh, Robert Frost's poem, and we'll go through that here in a few minutes. If I'm sure most people are relatively acquainted, but if not, you will be here in just a moment. Um, we'll go ahead and read the scripture reading, and then I'll, I'll make some comments back on that after if we... Uh, read through that. Everything I read tonight will be from the New American Standard Bible, the 1995 translation. This is going to be the only one posted along, posted behind me, so if you care to follow along, I encourage you to use your Bibles. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So, a lot of times we read, read that passage, right? And, and the first thing that pops in our head is, is uh, a piece of the road not taken, which is the name of that actual uh, poem that Robert Frost wrote. But a lot of times in American English, we call it the road less traveled, right? That's an idiom we use a lot. We say that and a friend of mine in college had it tattooed. And I'm sure some of you people have it hanging on the walls of your house, right? Um, and it's a nice sentiment and it does apply to this verse. And I'm going to go through a couple other verses that it does apply to. I, I'm not making fun of the poem. It's not a bad poem. We'll go through it here in just a minute. Um, but what I want to lean on is that we're not usually on the road less traveled, right? The road that we're on usually looks about like the one behind me. And that's an actual picture of I-95 in South Miami, where I used to live, where I used to live. And that's exactly what it looks like on Wednesday nights. And that's exactly the piece of it that I had to drive through to get to church on Wednesday nights. And a lot of times you don't want to be in the middle of that road more traveled, but we can't help it. That's the world we live in. And that's the life we have to live, right? So uh, let's let's look at that poem. We'll go, we'll go back to talking about I-95 a lot, actually. Most of the sermon will talk about I-95. But in Robert Frost's poem it reads like this. I don't blame you if you can't read it up there. I've got it on black and white in my computer. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in, in leaves, no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept first for another day, yet knowing how ways, way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Really nice sentiment to this poem, and it does have lots of Christian morals in behind it. And, you know, don't don't pick the easy way just because it's the easy way or the safe way. You know, the safe option isn't always the best option. And what Robert Frost is saying here, especially in the last paragraph, a lot of it's just filler up until that is, you know, you, you'd like to say, well, I'm going to take this one today and I'll come back tomorrow and I'll take the other trail and I'll get to experience it all. But you know, most of the time, that's not the case. You got to live in the moment, right? The, the choice that you make today is the choice you have to stick with today. You know, tomorrow you might be able to make choice B, but you know, for now, for all intents and purposes, the choice you're going to make is the choice you're going to stick with for the day. And again, really nice sentiment does line up with Matthew chapter uh, seven. Uh, the passage we just read pretty well. Again, I'll read it one more time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few be there that find it, right? So in the poem, he talks about the two different paths and about how they look to be the same. He did look way down before he picked one, and, you know, one looked just as good as the other. It wasn't like the opening scene from Beauty and the Beast, you know, the one's got the scarecrow, or the, the crow's call, and the other one leads the sunshine. In the case of this poem, they, they looked about the same, except one was worn down a little more, right? He said nobody really turned, he could tell from the leaves that nobody turned back, neither, neither one of the paths was bad, right? But the one was less traveled, right? And that does parallel nicely because uh, it tells us that, you know, the, the way to Jesus, to God through Jesus is, is the, the straight gate, the narrow gate, the one that's not picked as commonly, right? Uh, it's, you know, not everybody's going to find it. Um, Jeremiah chapter six for an Old Testament reference kind of says something similar. Jeremiah six and 16 says, thus said the Lord, says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths for good is for the good way is, and walk in it. And when you find rest for your souls, but they said, we will not walk in it. Let's look at that one more time. I kind of stumbled through it a little bit. Stand by the ways 
and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it, right? Just the first half is the part that really lines up, right? Don't just pick the path that you see, you know, stop and take stock, figure out which path is the one that really is the straight and narrow gate, the one that we should be picking, right? And those sentiments line up nicely with uh, Robert Frost's poem here and the load, the road less traveled, right? As, as we nicely put it. Um, and, and that, you know, we ended the sermon right there. You know, just stop what you're doing, take stock of where you're at, look at your path, see where you're going. Is this what God wants me to do? WWJD, check your bracelet and then pick it, right? Sermon over. Um, but that's not how this is gonna go. You're stuck with me for a few more minutes. Um, these verses sound like we should be walking down the yellow brick road, right? And does anybody in here feel like their life is the yellow brick road? Hold your hand up if you think it's yes. You live on the yellow brick road? Well, that's one out of, I think there's 67 of us tonight. Quick, I counted quickly. Um, but no, right? For the most part, we wouldn't say that, right? We live in modernity. We live in a fallen world, right? And we learn about that in the Old Testament, right? There's a reason we live in the world that we live in. And, you know, God put us here for a reason. And we can talk about Genesis chapter three, but that's not quite where I'm going to go with this one, right? So the road that we're on, who's on that road with us? So let's look at what Romans says in Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three in verse 20, starting in verse 21 says, but now apart from the law of the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short in the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to, step to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed, right? So there we go. Nobody deserves to be on the yellow brick road because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? So it's a nice idea and it's a good thought and that's where we ideally should be in Munchkin land, but that's not really how it goes, right? If the road less traveled, is full of Christians, we'd all be walking on the yellow brick road, right? But we can't really get to that road less traveled because we're all walking on the same road. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, if, whether we proclaim to be Christians or we haven't, right? And even still, if there was some kind of so-called yellow brick road that we could walk on with Christians to our left and Christians to our right, and we're all textbook followers of God, followers of Jesus, things still wouldn't be ideal, right? Let's look at what happened in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 43. <clears throat> Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, came up and accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs, who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given, him, given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him. So, for there's this ideal idea of the Elbrick Road where we're only surrounded by Christians and we're perfectly safe, right? If Jesus wasn't safe from that, then why do we expect to be, right? There is no road less traveled slash yellow brick road slash safe zone, right? We're all driving down that I-95 highway, whether we like to be or not, whether we want to or not. <clears throat> the yellow brick road doesn't exist, or if it does, nobody here lives on it because Jesus didn't. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24 talks about that a little bit. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who has sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain and the tares became evident also, the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to, gra to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to my reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up but gather the wheat into my barn. That's a really dynamic parable. You know, there's lots of different ways you can take that. And obviously Jesus is talking about the judgment, what's going to happen in the judgment when we are separated, right? <clears throat> and a deeper level of that, you know, is, is not that we're sown to be either the tear or the wheat. You know, it's, we're not predetermined or predestined whether we're going to be the good 
the good uh, produce or the bad produce, right? But that is going to be defined at a point in time, and we're all living together, whether we want to or not. You can't get away from it, and that's the way it's going to be till the very, very end, right? And then the tares will be gathered and burned, and the, the good bundles will be put into the barn. So Jesus clearly tells us that we're not on our own special road. We got to live in this world and we have to deal with all of its shortcomings. And again, if you want to know why we live here and what's going on, we can read Genesis chapter three and God's pretty explicit about what he, what, what happened there. And, and, you know, he quite easily could have destroyed mankind, right? But he did put us in the fallen world that we're in as a punishment, rightfully so. So for the rest of the sermon, I'm going to talk a little bit about the crazy road that we're all on, right? You can compare it to I-95 or whatever interstate you've been on before. Uh, I'll talk about Pittsburgh at the end so everybody can relate a little bit, but most of it will be uh, I-95 in Miami because I found some really good pictures. So <clears throat> this is the exit where I used to live in South Florida. If you drive right down the middle where it says I-95 South, uh, I found another picture, but I didn't put it in the sermon. About a mile, there's a big sign that says no more interstate. That's it. That's the end of the rainbow. That's as far as you can go. But just from these signs alone, you can go north, south, east, west, all by going straight. And that doesn't even sound possible, but that's how it goes, right? So you're coming up on these signs and there's, you don't, there's no second chances, right? You read it once and what you pick is what you pick. What you get is what you get. Robert Frost says you can pick the right or the left. Whichever one you pick is the one you're going to stay in, right? Um, worse yet for me, I had to exit off of this road a little bit behind on a toll highway called the Dolphin Highway, also called the 386, right? So everything's got two names. Every, half of everything's written in Spanish, so you're confused that much. And then, you know, you take the wrong term, you're going to start paying tolls. Some of the tolls really weren't that bad. If you had the right sun pass, you could pay 48 cents. Not that big a deal. You do that five times a day, five days a week. Those rack up pretty fast, right? You're going to lose your Starbucks coffee. So to make it even more confusing, there's another sign there for State Route 41. State Route 41 is the next exit beyond the Dolphin Highway, right? It's really only about two and a half city blocks away. They drive parallel the whole length of the city of Miami. They run east and west, right? One, you have to pay a toll, one you don't. When I got there, I'm taking the no toll road. I'm going to be the local guy and have this figured out. The first time I took the no toll road, it took me 45 minutes to get from one side to the other. I did that for a week and I was depressed the whole first week I was down there. I'm like, I'm just going to stay in my apartment. I couldn't even find McDonald's. It was a block behind me, but I'm like, I can't even, I can't even buy fast food. This is ridiculous. And so after doing that a couple of times, I just bit the bullet. I got the sun pass and I got on the Dolphin Highway, 12 minutes, one way. 40, 45 minutes on the, the State Route 41, 12 minutes on the toll road, right? But that's a luxury I had because I was down there for six months altogether. It took me maybe six weeks to figure it out. But if you're going down to most everybody in this room, I imagine you won't have six months to figure out Miami. If you're going to go visit, you might have you know, a couple of days. And by the time you think you get the handle on, it's time to come back, right? That place is nuts. Neither one of those roads were bad, right? One was the road, the, the road less traveled actually the no toll road. So I took that one, but everybody was paying to get on the toll road. Well, that was the better road, right? Just because it wasn't the road less traveled doesn't necessarily mean it was the one I shouldn't or shouldn't take, right? But my point here is, is you're going to make a decision, you have to stick with it and you're going to have to deal with the consequences. They might be great, they might not be great, or they might be good and they might be bad, right? You might get on the best road, but you also got to pay a toll. And if you don't have the right sun pass, you're going to pay extra money, right? So there's all these little rules and stipulations that you figure out and you got to figure out most of them in hindsight. And so, if you back up a little bit, or actually, this is a little bit forward. So that, that was your warning sign. And you keep on going, and you see what those signs we're talking about. The one to the left hooks around and goes north. The two in the middle, one goes left and goes east, one goes straight, and one goes south. And then the one to the right goes west, right? So from all those four signs, you get one warning, and that's the way that it's going to go. You're either going to go north, south, east, or west, exactly like I said. Um, but the problem is, these pictures are ideal. There's only, that, that might look like heavy traffic to some people, but wall-to-wall -wall traffic in Miami is nuts. Like literally every place a car can be, there's a car there, right? So even if you want to make your decision, you have a good idea what you want to do, sometimes you can't take the road you want to take. With these roads, a lot of the times, you just get that one choice there, right? So here's your exit. Ready or not, it's time to do something, time to make a decision. You're going to take the road less traveled, road more traveled. You're going to pay the toll. You're not going to pay the toll. Whatever it is, you're going to pick this lane. 
when we moved out of Miami, I really did my dad a disservice because I let him drive the first leg and we're driving. And he's like, what is with these people? I'm like, this is just how the Cubans drive, man. They're driving a hundred miles an hour while you're driving 40. And they were in these little tiny, might as well have been a motorcycle. And he's driving a U-Haul and they about ran him off the road. He had the big car. That's just the way it is. Um, ready or not, the world's going to move on. Let's look at second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six, starting in verse one. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. And behold, now is the day of salvation. The signs are there. God has it laid out for us. You know, the paths to take are, are, not obvious. I'm very careful not to use that word. That's the first word that comes to mind, but that's not necessarily it because we read about that in different passages, right? The Ethiopian eunuch's a really good example. He had the text and he's sitting there studying and he said, uh, Philip walks up to him. He says, how can I help you? He says, I, I don't understand what's going on here. And Philip lays it out for him. He said, here's the path you should take, right? The signs were there. The road was there, but Philip was his GPS. Philip said, okay, this is what you need to do. The eunuch says, great, let's do it. Here's water. Let me, what hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, let's do it. And they got it over with. And it was that easy, right? But until he had the directions, until he had the GPS, until he had Philip there to help him, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go. He was stuck. He didn't even know there was a fork in the road, right? All he saw was a bunch of signs and he just stayed where he was because he didn't know what to do. Um, let me elaborate on this a little bit more uh, with another poem, right? We just finished Christmas. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard that before, this before, um, but one of the most popular Christmas songs sung by Judy Garland flashback to Yellow Brick Road, uh, Dorothy from Wizard of Oz. She sings the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, right? And the actual song, she wouldn't, she didn't record it the way that it was written. The guy who made the poem that, that gave the lyrics to the song uh, went something like this, and she wouldn't sing it because she didn't feel like it fit to the movie and it was too depressing, but, but I think there's some really wise ideas here. The original lyrics for Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas says, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. It may be your last. Next year, we may all be living in the past. Have yourself a merry little Christmas, pop the champagne cork. Next year, we may be all living in New York. No good times like the olden days, happy golden days of yore. Faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us no more. But at least we will all be together. If the Lord allows, from now on, we'll have to muddle through somehow. So have yourself a merry little Christmas now. The opportunities you have are presented here now. Once you get to the point where these roads turn and split, it's already too late. By the time you saw the signs in Miami, it might even still be too late, right? But if you're lucky enough that you can figure out where you need to go and you find the right sign and you get in the right lane, time to make the decisions now. Because if you try to get off and get back on in Miami, you know, you, you probably can't. Good luck with that. Um, but to apply to our daily lives, right? That, that poem from Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, the original, you know, is even though it's depressing, right? And in the movie, Judy Garland singing it to her little sister, and it sounds like they're all going to die. Um, embrace the here and now, because you have time and opportunity now. You know, once you get past that exit, you might be able to turn it around, but you might not. Take advantage of what you have now. Now, the other direction on I-95, you're turning around and trying to get back to Fort Lauderdale from downtown. Um, you can do it both ways, but it's more common going north. Uh, you can get in express lane, right? And the express lane is, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes shorter than the normal lane in the span of two hours. It saves a little bit of time, but it's just as jam-packed as all the other lanes, right? And if you can see that up there, that says 550 one way, that is cheap. Usually it's about 13, $14 one way, right? And some people are willing to pay that. Some people get in the lane that they want, right? Uh, Dr. Braffin, one of the doctors I work for down there, he said, it does not matter. I will take it every time, both ways. 13 down, 13 back for the 25 minutes it saves me. My life is too short. I'm going to come down here and make money. I don't care. I'll pay a piece of it to get to and from. That's it. I'm paying the express lane, right? That's fine. It all depends on what you want to accomplish, though, right? If you're going to use it, you better be sure of yourself. You better be sure that that decision you're going to make, for better or for worse, is the one that you're willing to live with, right? And I want you to check all the details. Use every cue and clue that you can. I'll elaborate on this in just a minute. But let's read from Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18 says, 
with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf. This is Paul speaking that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness, the mystery of the gospel. Again, referencing things like what we re what we talked about with the Ethiopian eunuch. I didn't read that passage. For which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. God gives us, and he gave us, right? The church, gospel, the apostles, and our fellow Christians, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He gives us these tools that we can use to understand those cues and clues, right? To help make our decisions for better or for worse, right? Now, you could be choosing bold face opposition to what the Bible says, right? You may hear something from your brothers and sisters. You may not hear something from your brothers and sisters. The Bible's pretty explicit on a lot of those things. And if you're going to disobey, you're going to disobey, right? However, it's not always that cut and dry, right? People do make bold faced choices to disobey the gospel. However, you might accidentally be in the wrong lane and you're going to run out of road and you don't know about it, right? So if you're going to make any of these decisions, make sure you use those cues and clues because if you don't, it might cost you because a hundred yards behind this sign is this sign. And if you can't see it, it's black and white and it says toll violations photo enforced. If you do not have the Florida Sun Pass, they will charge you an additional $100 on top of the 14 or 15 that you were willing to pay. And if you don't see that sign, which there's only happens once, and you go on through and you see the price tag and you say, well, man, I want to get in there. There's a bunch of orange cones right there. See these? If you're in that left lane, you're already stuck. And there's that, there's that sign. I see the sign. I want to get out. But guess what? Running over those cones, I believe there's more signage. It's like, I don't know, $1,200 a piece for every cone you hit. People still did it, but um, you might be stuck, right? Make sure you use those cues and clues because it might cost you. Now, if you're riding along with somebody and you're going 55 and a 35 and somebody says, hey, whoa, whoa, slow down. The speed limit dropped, we're in a construction zone, whatever, right? Speeding's a, an interesting thought because you know you could be going a little bit over and technically you're still breaking the, breaking the speed limit, but most people in here would agree that if you're going 20, 30, 40 miles over the speed limit, you'd probably say something to the person driving, right? Because most people wouldn't make that decision consciously. Nate's smiling at me, but most people wouldn't. So they're not only concerned for your well-being, but their own, right? If you get pulled over going 30, 40, 50 miles over the speed limit, and that's criminal, you're probably going to get arrested in the middle of this traffic, and the person riding along with you is going to suffer for it too right? Let's read a big passage out of the Old Testament. Bear with me, and if you're going to open your Bibles, now's the time. Numbers chapter 22. Numbers 22, starting in verse 22. Again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. All right. But God was angry because he was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way was an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and the two servants were with him. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword, with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned away, turned from the way, and went into the field. But Balaam, this is the guy riding the donkey, I didn't elaborate on that before in the earlier verses, but Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Now the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path in the vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, and she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right and to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with a stick. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, no. Verse 31 says, then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way which his, with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed all the way to the ground, and the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary. But because your way was contrary to me, the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would have surely killed you just now and let her live. 
Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. So what we can learn from this example we see in Numbers of Balaam is that, you know, the donkey probably didn't know that it was safe, right? It's from what we read in, in, in the scriptures, Old Testament and New, some of the angels can be kind of scary looking, right? And especially even if they weren't, you know, even if it did look like a man, he had a sword. And the donkey was old enough and smart enough to know that swords weren't good for the donkey, right? Um, now, we read here that the donkey would have been fine either way, but it wasn't going to be so good for Balak or Balaam, excuse me. And Balaam, you know, abused the donkey because of the repeated pleas for the donkey. The donkey was trying to save both of them, right? As far as the donkey was concerned, very likely it was trying to help itself as well, but it was trying to save its master. And Balaam just kept getting mad, right? So when somebody tells you, hey, slow down, you're going too fast, we're going to get in trouble, you're going to get in trouble, you know, it's, that can be aggravating sometimes, you know, leave me alone, let me drive, just let me do my thing. But, you know, it's for your own good. It's not only for your good, but for their own good, right? But everybody riding the car has to deal with your actions, you know, has to suffer the consequences from the decisions that you make. Um, again, you know, these reciprocations from your actions, they might not only affect you. The sins of man only lead to destruction. We understand that. Romans chapter 3 and 23, we read earlier, talks about that. Um, but your sins might be affecting more than you. You, know, you have a family, you have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you have co-workers. Every decision you make affects several different people. There's a chain of, chain of command there. You know, recently, every time we've been driving through Zanesville, you know, Cody about has a heart attack, even though I'm the one driving. And, you know, it's not because she thinks I'm a bad driver. I hope not. Um, or vice versa. But it's because every little move that the other cars on the road make are going to affect you. You know, whether they're a Christian or not, the people on the road you're walking on, the decisions they make affect you for better or for worse. So you, you make these decisions and you take stock. Well, I can deal with it. If I get arrested for going 30 over the speed limit, then, you know, that it is what it is. But that's not defensive driving, as we would teach, you know, young drivers, right? You got to pay attention to everybody else on the road because you don't know what they're going to do, or how that's going to affect you. Cody and I pulled out of our house just here 50 minutes ago, and some guy, could have been a kid, I don't know, driving a lifted truck, pulled out a save a lot, whipped a donut into the road, gunned it as hard as he could, and somebody stopped him, was turned in on Pine Lane, and he about plowed right back into the back of him, right? Two cars, it would have been a three-car pileup. It just happened within an hour ago. And that was all because one decision of the person being dumb in the back. And the one person was just trying to turn and go home. The other guy was stuck in the middle. Couldn't go anywhere because the guy in front of him was stopped trying to turn in and go home. The decisions of other people affect you just as much as your decisions affect them, right? So whether we like it or not, we're not on the yellow brick road. We're on the road more traveled. One last parallel, then the lesson is yours. This might look more familiar to most people in this audience. Uh, if you want to hear a funny story about us getting lost in Pittsburgh, you can ask my grandpa. Um, when you're driving to Pittsburgh, especially from this side, you're cruising along and you're in the middle of the woods and then all of a sudden, it's like a portal. It's like magic. You come through the tunnels and you're in the middle of downtown Pittsburgh and you're taking it in. You're like, man, this is pretty, especially if it's your first time. But if you're the one driving, you need to watch these signs. I think there's two of them, but you, by the time you get to the second one, if you need to get all the way left, which most of us do, you're going to the North Shore to a Steelers game or a Pirates game. If you don't get all the way left, you're headed right into downtown. And who knows what's going on downtown. Usually a couple of roads are blocked off for this, that, or the other, and you're going to end up headed toward the hockey stadium. Maybe there's a hockey game going, you can get down there. But if you're not paying attention, you're not going to go where you want to go. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we exalt and hope the glory of God. And not only this, but we exalt our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within the hearts of the Holy Spirit, who is given to us. Verse 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. 
Verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were all enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son. And much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we may have now received the reconciliation. This life is tricky. There's lots of twists and turns, and the road's not going to go straight. You want to you want to get on that straight gate. Narrow is the road, and, and few be there that find the straight gate. We talk about, but the road of life does not go straight. It would be really nice to get in your lane, keep on driving, and stay where you're at. But if you do that, you won't end up where you want to go, right? Even if you feel like you're following Jesus explicitly. That white car in front of you is Jesus. And you're trying to follow all the lane changes he makes. You still have to pay close attention if you're following somebody, especially on a road like this, right? If you're going down 800, 147, one lane road, you just get on it and drive straight and it's fine, right? But that's not the way it goes, right? You have to pay close attention even if somebody's leading you. You got to watch them because one head turn, you look back, they're gone. A semi truck got in front of you and you have no idea where they went. Now you have no idea where you're going, right? But you can use your GPS, right? The Bible, like we talked about with Philip. Um, use your brothers and sisters, sisters, the passengers, right? They might have been watching, hey, Jesus made a left turn up here, following that way, right? Because if you're lost, downtown Pittsburgh, downtown Miami, you're going to wish that you weren't, right? Because it's really hard to get back on track. And that's what I have for you tonight. If you're lost, we would very, very happily try to help you get back on track. Um, this is more of an encouraging lesson, you know, but just as much for those who aren't baptized, who haven't begun to follow Jesus, here's your checkpoint. Here's your place to get on the road. Your decisions always have and always will affect others, right? But thankfully, we have a nice system built by God. We can help each other. We can encourage each other. People know the roads that we're on, right? We can ask for advice, and they can tell us how to get where we want to go, how to navigate through what we're going to do. There's not always an answer. Somebody can't always give you the answer you want to go, and you might not be able to get where you're going from where you are, right? But if you don't start, you will still be lost. And that's what I have for you this evening. If you've not begun your life following Jesus in baptism, I encourage that you do so. Uh, while time is still available. If you feel like you're lost, I ask you to come forward and we can pray for you. Please do so as we stand and sing.